It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we know. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now I know my family doesn't want to be here. Sometimes I don't want to be here, especially on a day like this when I can go swimming. But it's the Word of God is extremely important and we can... Even though it's easy to get sidetracked, and it's easy uh, for all of us, me included, to get sidetracked by the pleasures of life, we've got to understand that we're a nation in trouble, in serious trouble, and we need positive volition. And you might say, well, I get my spiritual food either way. Well, that's true, but it's important that we have enough motivation to actually love the Word of God enough to give it a hearing at least. And uh, we need it today because whether you know it or not, our nation is on what they do. They activated our missile defense shield. Didn't even know we had one, but they activated it because North Korea said they're going to shoot a missile. They didn't say if they're going to shoot it for testing. They probably will. I doubt they would nuke us. If they were to do that, they would <laughs> we'd obliterate that place. But, you know, there are psychotic people everywhere especially in leadership in those dictator-type countries. And so we activated our defense shield, and I guess it's a lot of saber-rattling, but it all brings us back to reality, to the, to the fact that our nation needs doctrine, and we need to have a pivot of mature believers so that uh, we can have our own defense shield, a defense shield from all the problems that will be coming to our country and are coming. So turn in your Bibles to Galatians 5.19. Galatians 5.19, we went over this before, but it was Friday, and for even me, that seems like an eternity ago when it comes to memory, and uh, we'll move further today than we did on Friday. Galatians 5.19, back to Galatians. We did a little short stint on Pastor Teacher and on Father's Day, a little bit on the Father and Authority. And now we're back to Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the sin nature are obvious, such as sor such a sort as these. Now the Apostle Paul is going to list four different types of sexual sins. It's not a complete list, it's just categories. And we have adultery, a category of sexual sin. Fornication, mental adultery, and lasciviousness. Now lasciviousness is the entire category of one part of the old sin nature. The other half of the old sin nature is legalism. Lascivious is also known as antinomianism. Those terms are interchangeable. Lasciviousness, antinomianism. And on the other hand, self-righteousness and legalism. So what Paul has done, he's been beating them up for being legalists. Well, he's beat up the legalistic part of the congregation, which was most of them. And now uh, some others reacted in the congregation who did not have that trend of self-righteousness. And so he beats them up on their uh, sins of lasciviousness. Now Galatians 4.21. And in Galatians... Or 5.21. In Galatians 5.21, it deals with the inner and outer sins, mental attitude sins, and overt sins. And he has envyings. Envying is a mental attitude sin in which there is an inner mental attitude sin. Murders, that's an outer sin. Drunkenness, nocturnal and riotous parties, and we studied what that was all about, referring to the parties in the ancient world where there was drug abuse and demon activity. And this still occurs in many parts of the world today, even probably in some parts of this country where they have those satanic parties, and they do have them. That's part of it. Drug abuse, and uh, also all sorts of types of weird things with animals and people and everything else. Uh, and then after that, uh, we have... Well, let's see, where was I? We have these sorts of things, and then we went all the way up through... 
Well, it looks as if I skipped the whole verse, didn't I? Let's go to 520. That's why I'm confused. 520. Now, in Galatians 520, he gives us the next four categories of sin. And we studied this, and you should have it already, so I'll go over it quickly. Number one, sin toward God. Number two, sin toward self. Number three, sin toward others. And number four, sin toward the Word. Now, idolatry is sin toward God, and that is when you worship worship anything in the place of God. And what that simply means for us, since we don't have idols, what it means we do, but it's in a different way, what it means for us as Americans in our modern culture simply means anything that you place as number one above Bible doctrine in your life is your idol. Whether it be a computer game, a TV show, or multiple TV shows. You see, you only have to set aside one hour a day. It's not difficult. But whether it be work or anything that you place above Bible doctrine, that becomes your idol, money, etc. And so this, this is a problem even for us today. Idolatry, and that's sin uh, toward God. Drug addiction. Drug addiction is sin toward self. It's pharmakeia in the Greek. P-H-A-R-M-A-K-E-I-A. That's sin toward self. Pharmakeia, sin toward self. You might be questioning the spelling. You might be right in doing so, but pharmakeia is where we get our word pharmacy, and that is sin toward self. Emulations, ambitious and envious rivalry is emulations. Wrath, that's when you get angry, have emotional outbursts without all the facts. Strife, that's when you organize factions against each other, getting friends on your side, splitting apart churches, etc. Seditions, seditions deals with uh, divisions among believers that are not based on doctrinal differences, but simply based on the little details of life. Heresies, a heresy is a sin toward the Word of God, and that's holding to an opinion that is contrary to the Word of God. The other sins of strife, emulation, and factions, that deals with sin toward others. Now now we're to Galatians 5.21. Envyings, a mental attitude sin. Murders, an overt sin. Drunkenness, nocturnal and riotous parties. And other similar things. I am warning you as I warned you before. Those who habitually and without restraint practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That does not mean you will not receive your eternal salvation. It refers to eternal rewards. And if you remain under carnality for the majority of your Christian life, you won't receive any rewards. And most people never get into fellowship, and if they do, it's only for a few moments. Maybe for an hour at church, and then after that, it's out of fellowship all day long. Well, you're not going to get any reward that way. You're spinning your wheels. You're going backwards. So what we need to do is be filled with the Spirit. Now, I was thinking about the grace positioning satellite and how I could explain all of this to you today. GPS, grace positioning satellite. Well, a satellite, first of all, I watched some of this on the History Channel. You have a satellite down here. Maybe it's uh, California. Here's a satellite. Then, of course, there's one in space. Then there's one over here. We'll say that's South Carolina. And let's say they're uh, doing performing something in uh, California. They can shoot it straight up to a satellite and it bounces off and comes to South Carolina. Now, there is... Uh, a way we could look at it, and that is we could look at the, this one up here as the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's where it takes it all away from earth and then converts it up here into some spiritual phenomenon and then back down here. But what we have here is doctrinal orientation, and here is grace orientation. If you miss any of these links, if you're missing out on any of these links, the it's going to mess up. It's not going to work. So, let's say you receive doctrine, but you're not filled with the Spirit. What's that mean? Well, it, it can't it can't go straight across from California to 
to South Carolina because the earth is not flat. The earth is, you know, you go from California to South Carolina, the earth is round. So the signal, it can't do that. It can't go straight that way. So without the filling of the Spirit, you're lost. The signal will bounce right back off the earth and into space because the earth is round and it's not a flat surface. So, the only way you can really ever have doctrinal orientation, and the only way you can get it is to learn doctrine. But the only way to learn doctrine is you can't miss out on this part, the grace positioning satellite, and that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit. And then from this position of space, it can shoot it down to earth, any point on the earth. And that's because it's way up here. And it can shoot it back down to South Carolina. You're watching a program being broadcast from California. Shoots up to the satellite. Shoots down to here. And this is the only way you can transfer doctrine into grace. If the only thing you do, you can hear doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. You can listen to doctrine for every day. From, for the rest of your life. From now on, you can listen to doctrine every day. But if, you do not, if you're never filled with God the Holy Spirit, the only thing you're going to try to do is force the issue on other people. The only thing you're going to try to do is uh, there'll be strife and there'll be envyings. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is not involved and the Holy Spirit produces a whole other thing. So the filling of God the Holy Spirit is our teacher, our mentor, and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. So we learn doctrine. The filling of the Holy Spirit converts it. And this is about the same as Operation Z, just a different way to show it to you. God, the Holy Spirit, converts it into epinosis, and then it's shot down here. And actually, technically, when it comes into your TV set, your TV set transfers the zeros and ones into a picture. It's all very technical and very strange. I still don't know the, how it really works in terms of turning zeros and ones into a picture, but it does. But it takes this transfer from the filling of the Holy Spirit. So you learn doctrine. Doctrine is the teacher, in other words, of grace orientation. And if you're not filled with the Spirit, doctrine doesn't become the teacher of grace orientation. You'll never be grace oriented. You can listen to Bible doctrine for 30 years and never get to grace orientation. I've known people in legalism or who, who still have legalistic thoughts even though they've been under doctrine for so long. And why is that? There's a, there's a malfunction. And usually the malfunction is related to the filling of the Holy Spirit. Actually, it's all related to that. You're not filled with the Spirit. No matter how much doctrine you learn, you will turn that doctrine into a system of legalism, into a system of shoving it down someone's throat. For example, you might find out uh, through doctrine that people should not live together in sin. Of course, they should not. And so you want to make an issue out of it with that other person. That's not grace orientation. That person may not be saved, and if they are saved, they may have been recently saved, and really, they'll learn, they'll grow out of it in time. And you need the filling of the Holy Spirit so that you don't force the issue. And if you, and there is another way to look at it too. You see, you can start out with just doctrine. Some people don't like to listen to doctrine. Some people hate doctrine. They say they love the Lord, but they hate doctrine. Well, what they're focusing on is more over here not that they have any grace orientation but they don't care about doctrine they're all about the love for God and you got to love God and you got to feel saved etc and so now in South Carolina trying to transfer a signal to California and that's going to malfunction because there's no doctrine and uh, you cut off the doctrinal signal well you're not filled with the spirit because you'll go into heresy but uh, on this side of it what happens is you go into what's called asceticism and emotionalism. Asceticism and emotionalism. Asceticism giving up things for Christ. Emotionalism running up and down aisles shouting, shouting hallelujah thinking God's impressed with that. And so there's a group of people who do that who hate doctrine and they just go off emotion 
and they're, they're not even going any higher than a ceiling. They're not going up into a space, as it were. They're not getting up into a spiritual phenomenon. So the only way we can ever really learn doctrine is with the filling of the Spirit, and that's important, and a very important leap that uh, most people don't even know about. They think of the Holy Spirit as some emotional event. And they think that when they're filled with the Spirit, they're going to feel good, etc. When you're filled with the Spirit, you'll feel, feel good, but not when you're filled with the Spirit. That, don't have, that makes no difference to your feelings whatsoever. It makes a difference to how you think. Because finally, you're learning these doctrines because God the Holy Spirit has taught them to you. So we have envyings, murders, drunkenness, nocturnal and riotous parties, and other similar things. I am warning you as I warned you before, those who habitually and without restraint practice such things will not inherit, inherit the kingdom of God. And that word inheritance is very important in that you will not receive any eternal rewards. You must log time under the filling of the Holy Spirit and you must log more time under the filling of the Holy Spirit than just one hour a day. Meaning when you're at work and somebody gets on your nerves or you go into a gossiping rant, we've all done it, I've done it, but uh, when you go into a gossiping rant about somebody at work because they've done something that you don't like and you might be right and you might be wrong, but you're wrong as soon as you step out of line and gossip, you've lost the filling of the Spirit. You're in carnality and you are not logging time under the filling of the Spirit, and during that time you might as well chalk it up as you're in danger of losing your rewards. You need to be filled with the Spirit, which also brings out the importance of 1 John 1, 9. And when you study sin as such as we're doing now, you must understand rebound, and all of us do. And so now we're going to take a look at some sins. We're going to look at some other uh, verses related to sin since the Apostle Paul is on this subject. We're going to study the issue of sin. Now for the unbeliever, the issue is not sin. The issue is rejection of Jesus Christ as Savior. For the unbeliever, the issue is rejection of Christ. They reject Christ. It has nothing to do with sin for them because they're not even going to be judged on the basis of sin. They're going to be judged at the last judgment on the basis of their good works. That's for revelation. For the believer, the issue is sin related to living your spiritual life. And if you don't use 1 John 1, 9, if you don't know what it is and you don't use it, you'll never make it. 1 John 1, 9 must be used constantly in your life. Every time you sin, which is oftentimes constantly, until you grow up enough, to know better or until you begin to have so much love for the Lord you don't want to violate what he says anymore so in the New Testament the word sins is in the plural and that refers to the personal sins as an action the word sin in the singular refers to the old sin nature now Romans 5.13 is an exception but we won't go over that because we've studied sin before but let's look at other categories of sin such as some other New Testament categories of sin Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 Colossians 3 5 through 10 is what we'll look at these are some more New Testament category of sins and this of course was also written by the Apostle Paul not only the greatest genius of all time probably but also the greatest spiritual genius of all time. The Apostle Paul, a phenomenal man. Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Therefore, begin to put to death the members of your earthly body. How do you do that? Put to death the members of your earthly body. How do you do it? Rebound. When you rebound, you are, as it were, putting to death the old sin nature. It no longer is functional. And as we will study in 1 John one day, we will note that when you are filled with the Spirit, it's impossible for you to sin. Oh, you will. You'll choose to sin, but what it's saying is the filling of the Spirit is a restraint. And if you're filled with the Spirit, you're not sinning. And if you're in carnality, you are. It's just t talking about the absolute of the filling of the Spirit. Therefore, begin to put to death the members of your earthly body. Immorality. That includes all categories of immorality from uh, 
uh, sexual immorality to chemical immorality, criminal immorality, all of those categories. Impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And so here the Apostle Paul actually explains idolatry and says, look, all these other things amount to idolatry too. Maybe you're real interested in making money and that's all the time you make for is making money and you can't set aside one hour a day for doctrine. You know what that means? Greed. Your whole life is wrapped up in money or the details of life. That's tantamount to idolatry. Evil desire. You might have an evil desire and that includes all categories uh, for anything. Just some Evil desires include things like strife and all of that, trying to get the upper hand through envy. That's part of idolatry because you spend your whole time in carnality and not filled with the Spirit seeking some pleasure out of life. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And it's on account of these things that the wrath of God will come to these United States of America. And it will. It's just a matter of time. For it's on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked as unbelievers. He said, when you were unbelievers, you once walked in these things all the time. As an unbeliever, you're in slavery to these things. You can't break from these things as an unbeliever. No unbeliever can break from sin. Only we, believers in Christ, have been given the ability to break free from it through rebound and being filled with the Spirit. And we can actually live free from sin at least for a time for a time period and then when we sin we can rebound and go on for another time period without sin only believers can live without sin for a while but they will sin again it doesn't mean they're sinless it just means it stopped for a moment so and in and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. And that is, as unbelievers, we all lived in that as unbelievers. But now you also put these all aside, and that's through rebound and the filling of the Spirit. You have to rebound, disregard it, and follow up with the filling of the Spirit. But now you also put these all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. And a lot of legalists will say abusive speech, that means a cuss word. Well, no, it doesn't. Abusive speech means speech that is designed to hurt someone else. I can uh, say a cuss word, and it might be crude, and it might not be what society likes, but it's not sin, as long as it's not designed to hurt anyone else. You know, it's just a form of expression, a form of speech. So that's not what it's referring to. Uh, uh, abusive speech means you are really uh, trying to abuse someone to hurt them in some way with your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self, the old sin nature, with its evil practices and have put on the new self, the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is being renewed to a true knowledge. You are being renewed to a true knowledge because you've been... You are filled with the Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit is your teacher, the one who brings to your memory those things which you've forgotten. Renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. I believe this is all NIV. To the image of the one who created him. And that's referring to the unique spiritual life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord Jesus Christ lived the spiritual life and has passed it down to us. So what, what, what must we do? Put aside all these things. Not saying we'll never get involved in anger. We all will. We will we'll all get anger, angry probably till the day we die. Except if you're living, if you are dying the um, grace way, if you're going through uh, dying grace, if you're going through dying grace, you're not going to sin during that time of dying grace. You're just going to be ready to go and uh, you're not going to get angry because you're going to be living your life in the light of eternity. 
And if you become angry and you start to fall into sin while you're on your deathbed, that means sin face to face with death. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech, all of these things are some of the worst sins and you must rebound them, put it, put it in the past, disregard it, and move on and grow in grace. So verse 5, we will review Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Verse 5, begin to put to death the members of your body, a reference to rebound. The members of the body being a reference to the old sin nature because the old sin nature is called sarx, which is flesh. And the old sin nature is in our flesh. So verse 5 refers to rebound, also a reference to the old sin nature itself in our bodies. Secondly, we have the word pornea, which has been translated immorality. Uh, pornea means fornication, that is, unnatural sexual vices or any illicit sexual intercourse. The reason why they just trans translated it immorality, it includes any illicit sexual intercourse, homosexuality, voyeurism, all the different types you can think of uh, when they have sex with animals, etc. That's pornea. Then we have acartharsia. Acartharsia. A-K-A-T-H-A-R-S-I-A. -A -A, and that means impurity of mind. And that's referring to mental adultery. So immorality refers to the overt act of adultery, fornication, and any overt sexual sin. Impurity refer, refers to mental adultery or unnatural sexual lust. And that's acoparsia. Then we have pathos. P-A-T-H-O-S. P-A-T-H-O-S means degenerate passions. It's referring to passions. You see the word says passions, but it's the Greek word pathos means a degenerate passion. And this is specifically referring in this case, to homosexuality. It's a degenerate passion. It's a passion on the part of those people who have that weakness, and it's a degenerate passion. It's a degenerate category of sin, homosexuality and lesbianism. Then we have epithumia. E-P-I-T-H-U-M-I-A. Epithumia. And that means evil lust or desires. Epithumia, E-P-I-T-H-U-M-I-A. And that means evil lusts or desires, often referring to the evil lust and desire of malice to hurt someone else, to destroy someone else, to gossip about someone else. That's an evil lust and desire. Then we have Pleonesia, P L E O. P L E O N E Z I A. Pleonesia. P L E O N E Z I A. And you probably have a lot of, th of these things in your notes from when we study the old sin nature in essentials, but maybe not, so we'll go slowly. That's Pleone Pleonesia. That means having the will to have more. It's an inordinate lust or desire, also known as greed. Having the will to have more, but not just the will. It's an inordinate lust and desire. Nothing wrong with having nice things. Nothing wrong with having pleasurable things in your life. But uh, some people are never satisfied. They can have all the pleasurable things in their life at their fingertips, and they still aren't happy with it until they get something better. We all know people like that. And it's a sad way to live because they'll never, ever be happy with this type of inordinate lust or desire. Then we have orge. O-R-G-E. All of this comes from Colossians, the verses we just studied. Orge means anger. And this anger is generally caused by jealousy. Some of the worst angry brawls are called by jealousy. Just... Uh, go to your local uh, bar and watch a bunch of men fight it out over a woman. It's a lot of uh, anger related to jealousy. That's orge. Anger generally caused by jealousy. I've never been to a local bar around here. I just know in general that's what goes on. Then we have thumos. 
And if I did, it wouldn't matter anyway. Thumos, T-H-U-M-O-S. Thumos, T-H-U-M-O-S. That means emotions in turbulence or having a tantrum. Where emotions are in turbulence, actually referring to the emotional revolt of the soul, and you throw a tantrum. And you may not throw a tantrum in the way children do. Adults get more sophisticated about it. They might go in their room and shut the door and never come out. That's part of a tantrum, trying to get attention. Or they may uh, do something else for attention. An adult tantrum. That means you have emotional turbulence, thumos. Then we have kakia. K-A-K-I-A. K-A-K-I-A. And that means depravity. And that's evil directed towards someone. It means depravity related to evil directed towards someone. Almost a repetition of malice, but it's so important, Apostle Paul uses another Greek word referring to it. Then we have blasphemia. We know what that is, blasphemy. Blasphemia, B-L-A-S-P-H. E M I A. It's blasphemy, but just an I A on the end. It means to malign or slander the character of God, and people do all that all the time on the comedy channel. Just turn on the comedy channel, get some unbeliever up there trying to tell jokes. First thing he's going to do is uh, try to joke about Jesus Christ or God the Father or something else. It's become part of our culture to move into blasphemy almost. Saw on the news the other night. This young lady had become valedictorian of her high school. Saw this on Fox News, Bill O'Reilly, I believe. If it wasn't that, it was handed in Combs. And uh, this girl, very smart girl, very pretty, smart girl, and she had become valedictorian. And uh, they told, and they uh, told her to write a speech. So she wrote it, and they blacked out some parts of it. And what they blacked out was the parts where she was talking about Jesus Christ. They said, you can't say that. We've consulted with our lawyers, and you can't mention Jesus Christ. And they said, well, what about God? I mentioned God. Well, it's okay to mention God, but don't mention Jesus Christ. So our lawyers uh, told us uh, that uh, you should not do that. And so she, with her freedom of speech, got up and mentioned Jesus Christ. She talked about God the Father and everybody cheered and she talked about God's love and then she said, you know what? God loves you so much He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die for you. She didn't say as a substitute but she got that part straight. And as soon as she said that, they pulled the wire, cut her microphone. Ridiculous. Ridiculous stuff's going on out there. But that's blasphemia. To malign or slander the character of God. In our cult, we were founded on Judeo-Christian values and it's never been an issue in our culture until now, until recently, until the 90s really. It never became an issue regarding whether a student can get up and talk. Now I can understand limiting a teacher to academic things, but a student who has been so smart to win that, let her say what she wants to say. It's, you're honoring her. <coughs> Ridiculous! It just shows the depravity of our time. It's always depraved, but it's showing the degeneracy and the apostasy of our times. We're going to be punished for it. We're going to get a big wake-up call. One morning we're going to wake up in uh, San Francisco or Seattle or something like that. It's going to be blown off the map. We've already had one wake-up call. People would go back to the way they were. Then we have Iscrologia. Ice Quologia, A I S C H, A I S C H R O L O G I A. That means deformed or ugly speech, not referring to cussing. You can cuss up a storm and never hurt anyone. It might offend some ninny, but it's not going to hurt anyone. It means deformed or ugly speech. And it refers to talk that hurts others. Talk that hurts others. Now turn your Bibles to Proverbs 6.12.
And we will go from Proverbs 6, 12 through 19. And this teaches some categories of sins. It also, once we get uh, past uh, verse uh, 15, it also goes into the six thing, things which God abhors, yet seven murder. The only overt. That's why it says it that way. So Proverbs 6.12 Now verses 12 through 15 address the troublemaker. He is arrogant. He is jealous. And implacable, meaning unforgiving, with revenge motivation that is evil. He is a gossip. He or she, it uses he. He is a gossip and guilty of inordinate ambition and inordinate competition. The troublemaker is a desire in the local church and in any organization and every organization. Wherever the troublemaker goes, there's trouble. Troublemakers are always uptight. One thing about them, they're always uptight. In their own mind, troublemakers are always better than everyone else and always right. So let's look at verse 12. A worthless person, an evil man, is one who walks with a false mouth. This means that troublemaking is often generated through the mouth of gossip. And oftentimes, you can gossip with being correct. Ooh, I said somebody at the store and they got some beer. Okay, so they did. That's still gossip, right or wrong. That is, if you have an intent to hurt. It's often generated through the mouth and gossip, maligning and judging. A false mouth emphasizes the sins of the tongue. Verse 12 emphasizes the sins of the tongue. That's part of being a troublemaker. You get involved in the sins of the tongue. Verse 13. We're not to the seven worst sins yet. We're just getting some categories right now. Verse 13 teaches that a troublemaker often uses body language. That is to make fun of people. And this is how he makes fun of people. He winks with his eye. He signals with his feet. He points with his finger. All you have to do is go to any high school campus and see that everywhere. It was the same in my day. It was the same in your day. It's the same in your children's day. High school is full of a bunch of old sin natures until they grow up enough not to, that is in the spiritual life, not to do that. But usually they just take that old sin nature right with them to church and they keep on winking and pointing and signaling and uh, making fun of everybody. When I see somebody who's in rough shape, I say to myself, uh, except for the grace of God, there go I. That's what I say. I don't make fun of them. I don't make fun of crackheads or nobody. I just look at them and say, there for the grace of God, there go I. Except for the grace of God, there go I. And that should be our attitude, grace orientation. Not to make fun of people and not make, to make fun of their shortcomings. Winking means you wink as you run down someone. It's part of body language. Women are very good at this. So are men. Winking means you wink as you run down someone. To signal with the feet means to escape with the feet. And this was something we don't have. It's part of a culture we don't have. You see, they have different cultures in different countries. If in Iraq you shake somebody's left hand, you've just insulted them. Why? Because they wipe with their bare left hand. And you've just, uh, well, you, <laughs> you've made a mess out of both yourselves, but it's an insult. You never pull out your left hand in an Arab country to shake their hands. We don't have that custom because both our hands are clean. We use something called toilet paper. But some countries don't have it. And so part of their uh, making fun of somebody was to just uh, act like they were running with their feet. And that would be an insult. Or like when Saddam Hussein came down and it, the greatest insult for Saddam Hussein was to take off your shoes and beat his, the, a picture of him with uh, your shoe. And that is the greatest insult. We have other things like the middle finger, but they don't have that in the Middle East. And so all that's part of body language. And then, of course, it has pointing the finger, and we've all learned from youth it's rude to point your finger at other people. At least we should have. It is rude to point your finger at other people in order to make fun. So all this is related to body language of mockery, ridicule, and derision. And a troublemaker gets his kicks by putting other people down. 
He himself might be a slob, but he still enjoys putting other people down. And I've known a lot of people like that, and I'm not thinking about anyone here. I'm thinking about, uh, well, I won't tell you who it was. One of my bosses I had in the past, the only thing he or she would like to do is, uh, well, I guess she, her and her husband would go to a uh, Kmart, and she told us about it. And then they would sit there in their car, big fat lady and her skinny husband sitting there in their car, and uh, they would point at people walking into Kmart and just make fun of them. And that's how they got their kicks, and they'd do it for hours. Yeah, that's how they got their kicks. It's the, children do it, but it does carry over into adulthood. Anyway, verse um, 14 now. Perversity and his right load devises evil continually. A better translation would be, Malice is in his right lobe. He devises evil at all times. Again, a better translation. Malice is in his right lobe. He devises evil at all times. He spreads strife. Now perversity, the beginning of verse 14, is deviation from Bible doctrine. Perversity is deviation from Bible doctrine. The the person who is in this type of perversion doesn't go by what the Bible says. They go by what they feel and they're always wrong when they think they're always right. And you could show them a verse, but they're perverse and they're not going to believe you. They'll just gossip about you for showing you them the verse. And they'll just ignore the fact that it was in the Bible. They're still going to be pissed off. Well, he shouldn't even brought it up in the first place. I don't care if it was there. He shouldn't even been brought up. Yes, it should. It's part of the Word of God. That's the way people are. And sometimes people piss me off too. But you've got to, you just got to get over it and say, oh well. So therefore, verse 15, therefore his destruction will come suddenly. Therefore his destruction will come suddenly. That's a reference to divine discipline. He will be broken instantly. Divine discipline. And the same thing occurs with nations. It comes suddenly in order to shock you, in order to shock you out of what you've been doing. And it comes suddenly for a client nation in order to shock us. 9-11 came suddenly on a very beautiful day to shock us, and boy did it ever. It even shocked me. I knew it was probably going to happen, but still when it happens, you're kind of like, ooh, it's really happening. <laughs> kind of sends chills down your spine. It shocks you. And so these people might be going along just fine and they seem to be doing very prosperous and they seem and they may even feel as if they're getting away with something and then suddenly, bam, God's divine discipline hits them. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. And none of us get away with anything. So his destruction will come suddenly. He will be broken instantly and there is no remedy. And why is there no remedy? Because this person has gone into blackout of the soul and they will not rebound. They don't know what it is. They don't care what it is. This person is going straight for the sin face to face with death. So first the troublemaker suffers from self-induced misery. It's no fun being jealous of somebody. It's no fun being envious. It's no fun fighting. It's adrenaline rushing and it might cause a bit of a high every now and then. But there's always a crash from adrenaline. And it's no good. It's not good for the body or anything else. It will destroy your body, all that adrenaline all the time, getting pumped up when it shouldn't be. So you suffer from self-induced misery on the one hand, and then if it continues without rebound, it goes to warning discipline, intensive discipline, and then if you have moved into black out of the soul, eventual dying discipline, sin face to face with death. Now verses 16 through 19 is where we get the list of the seven worst sins in God's eyes. And they don't include fornication, adultery, drunkenness, or drug abuse. But they do include the mental attitude sins and the sins related to mental attitude sins, including the one overt sin related to that, which is murder. Verses 16 through 19. Proverbs 6, 16. There are six things which the Lord hates. In fact, seven are an abomination to his soul. 
As an anthropopathism, hatred here describes the policy of God in terms of a human modus operandi so that we can understand it. This means that if God did have hatred, he would hate these sins the most. If he did have hatred. You see, all sins aren't the same. All sins result in the same thing in that you're out of fellowship, but some sins carry heavier penalties. It's the same in uh, the law of divine establishment. You commit murder, you'll either be executed or spend life in prison in a good state. But if you uh, steal a car, you're not going to stay your whole life in prison. You see, there are varying degrees of punishment related to your sins. And these are the sins that receive the most punishment. They receive the most self-induced misery and they receive the most punishment from God the Father Himself. So verse 16, the, there are six things which the Lord hates. In fact, seven are an abomination to His soul. Verse 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Well, let's look at the first one. A proud look. What's that? Arrogance. Arrogance is the worst sin. And a lot of sins, almost all sins, stem straight out of arrogance. Actually, all of them do. All sins stem from arrogance, and arrogance is the father of the sins. You can look at arrogance as the father of all sins. The worst sin, it was the sin that Satan, uh, Satan committed. The very first sin he committed, arrogance. So arrogance, number one. But of course, arrogance includes everything from bitter, bitterness, jealousy, vindictiveness, implacability, being unforgiving, hatred, and self-pity, feeling sorry for oneself. The second one, a lying tongue. A lying tongue re refers to malicious gossip. You see, gossip in itself can be true or false. Malicious gossip is totally false. A, a, a lying tongue refers to malicious gossip and slander. Slander is false as well. Actually, a lying tongue also refers to gossip that may be true. That's just a category we have there. Now, number three. Hands that shed innocent blood, that refers to murder, of course. Now, I want you to notice something out of these three verses, if you haven't already. And it's very important that we all begin to categorize things in our mind. These are categories. Uh, verse uh, 17, where it says a proud look, that's a category of sin. Where does that sin originate in your thinking? That is a mental attitude sin. A proud look, category mental attitude sin. A lying tongue, gossip, that is verbal sin. Category number two, verbal sin. And number three, murder and overt sin. So the Apostle Paul is laying out three categories and then he's going to go on and expound on it. And murder, also note, is the only overt sin listed among the seven worst sins. Not fornication, not adultery, not those things that the Baptists think are the worst sins. The worst sins are mental attitude sins, verbal sins. And the only, the only overt sin that makes it into the top seven is murder. That's the only one. And murder is a very terrible sin. That's why it's in the top seven. Now in verse 18. In verse 18. A right load that devises evil conspiracies. That's number four. And feet that run rapidly to evil. That's number five. Now a right load that devises evil conspiracies is a frustrated person who becomes conspiratorial. As soon as authority makes one of these people in any field, whether it be at church or at work, whenever authority makes them feel uncomfortable, they do everything in their power to undermine that authority. And some people who aren't or authority orient, or, oriented should have went into the military or something to get straightened out. They might have, have a little more sense related to authority, right or wrong, it's authority. So this sin also refers to children who undermine the authority of their parents, and that happens all the time. Children who undermine the authority of their parents, they come up with their own little conspiracies. And they say, 
I'm going with uh, my friend Jennifer to uh, spend the night with her. And then you come find out there's no Jennifer, but there is a J word, Jeremy, or some other guy. And you say, uh-oh. Well, you should say, uh-oh, they're messing up. But by that time, it's a little too late. Not saying you shouldn't do anything. I'm just saying you're, you've, got, you've got your hands full. So this sin refers to children who undermine the authority of their parents, always trying to get around their uh, parents' authority. Oftentimes, they might not go that far, but they'll just play one parent off of another. Mommy said I could go. And then if Mommy didn't say they could go, well, they'll ask Daddy, and then they'll run from Daddy and say, Daddy said I could go. Usually Mommy says, you can go, and Daddy says, no way. So I write low that devises evil conspiracies. That includes anyone who undermines authority, whether it be the authority of a pastor, the authority of a president, the authority of uh, any authority, teacher, coach, parent. So as a result of this conspiracy, oftentimes there is active civil disobedience. We saw a lot of that in the 60s and 70s when we saw a lot of rejection of authority active civil disobedience. It still exists today, but it seems to have tapered off a bit. At least, but it could arise at any moment. You get a bunch of hungry stomachs and you'll have civil disobedience like you've never seen it before. Feet running rapidly to evil refers to criminality. These are people who enjoy destroying property or destroying life in the name of some crusade or just because they're crazy. Whatever. They just want to do something. They want to get their kicks out of murder saw something on television. These kids murdered somebody just because they wanted to know how it felt to murder somebody, to take someone else's life in their own hands. They just wanted to know how it felt. There's a Johnny Cash song about that, just to watch him die. Well, that's feet that run rapidly to evil. They kill a man just to watch him die, just to see, just interested. What's it like to watch somebody die at my hands? Verse 19 a false witness who utters lies, and he who sows discord between the brethren. Now, a false witness who utters lies, this refers, in fact, to the jurisprudence system. It refers to perjury. And one of the worst sins is perjury. We've had presidents commit perjury, and they've gotten just about clean away with it. But one of the worst sins is perjury. And I don't care what they're perjuring themselves about. Perjury. And when you let the people go above the rule of law, you've got a breakdown. But maybe some of that's been restored. Now Jews had the greatest system of jurisprudence and they did not allow any type of perjury. In fact, if you perjured someone for the sake of hurting them, if you tried to take someone to court and a lie about them and say, yeah, I saw them murder so-and-so just because you don't like them. If the court finds out about it, you're the one executed. What a wonderful law. So they did not put up with any type of perjury. He who, he who sows discord between the brethren. Sowing dis discord is sowing strife between the brethren and that's playing one person off of another, especially one believer off of another. And people do this all the time. And we've studied it before. A woman will go to another woman at work and say, so-and-so said this about you. And then that person gets mad and says, well, I say this and this about them. And then you run and tell them, she said this and this about you. And the next thing you know, there's a battle between two people that you created. And you get to stand in the middle and everybody comes and confides in you. And there you stand in your glorified position as the arbitrator and as someone who everyone confides in you so it gives you an ego boost. It's really sick, but it's part of the old sin nature. And people who go into this are perverse. It's really perverse. Now, 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 7 deals specifically with Christian sins. It deals specifically with the sins of uh, those who believed in Christ in this church age. 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 7. You say, why are we going over this? Because Paul listed a whole bunch of sins. We've got to know what these sins are about. Why? So that when we commit them, we can rebound it. If you don't know gossip of sin, you'll never rebound it. If you don't know stripes of sin, you'll never rebound it. 
So we've got to know what to rebound. That's why we need to know what all these sins are all about. 2 Timothy 3, 2-7 deals specifically with Christian sins. Verse 2. For mankind will be lovers of se- uh, lovers of self. Excuse me, that's true. Just drive down the highway and you'll see that. For mankind will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, which is where it all begins, ungrateful, and wicked. To be a lover of money doesn't mean you can't appreciate money. But it, it is sin in relationship to money in that you steal money or you're, in, you're dishonest in your business gains with money for the purpose of monetary gain. And of course, ungrateful. Most people today are ungrateful. Verse 3, unloving, implacable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, that is violent, haters of good of intrinsic value, So unloving here means you have no normal or natural love. Unloving is like the women who kill their children, who drown them in a lake. That is a weird type of hatred, and it's unloving, a natural hate, an unnatural hate, not a natural love. Verse 4, treacherous, thoughtless. You don't have any thought concerning anyone else. Conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's the crux of the whole thing. Verse 5, holding to a form of godliness, although they've repudiated its power, avoid such as these. We've studied a lot of passages that tell you to avoid certain amounts of people or certain types of people. And you better especially avoid those people who are involved in the seven worst sins. Those who gossip, those who malign, those who slander, those who are... uh, All those things we study. All those things we just went on over. Avoid those types of people, especially murderers. You'll end up dead. But uh, you must avoid these types of people, just as we must avoid legalists. Now, holding to a form of godliness means they act spiritual on the outside, but they're not. They're so far from the filling of the Holy Spirit, they don't even know what it is. They don't even know what it means to be baptized by the Spirit. They think baptism is a water or ritual. And they don't understand that when they believe in Christ, they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. They receive the indwelling of the Spirit and the filling. They don't understand what that means. Yet, and because they do not understand these things, they've got to come up with something to feel spiritual, to cover up all the trash. You just cover it up. And it doesn't work. You are a tomb, a beautiful whitewashed tomb filled with dead man's bones. That is for the unbeliever trying to whitewash himself. But believers do it too. They try to make out like they're so holy and they brag about how they go to church and they brag about how they tithe and they always get in competition. Yeah, I see you go to church every day over there. Well, I go to church too. And you must think you're so holy doing that. No, these people are crazy. These people are out of their minds. They're so far from the spiritual life, it's ridiculous. And they're not going to come close to it, and they never will. These are people who have repudiated the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And they're going under the energy of the flesh. And just as they try to please people in the flesh, they try to please God in the flesh. And as soon as something goes wrong in their life, just as they accuse people, they'll accuse God. My God, why have you left me, etc., they'll say. Why have you forsaken me at this time? God hasn't forsaken you. You've forsaken Him. And that is part of repudiating the power, the power of the divine dynasty, the filling of the Spirit in Operation Z. We will finish with verse 6 and 7. For among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women... The reason why the Apostle Paul uses women here instead of men is because Timothy was such a wimp, he had a lot of problems with women. He didn't have much problems with men. The men listened. Most of the problems with Timothy came from the women because he wasn't tough enough. You see, you just bark at a woman, she'll, she'll back down. And, uh, but he didn't know how to do that. And Paul had to tell him, look, you need to drink a little bit of wine, you need to calm down. 
uh, you need to get your stomach, uh, you know, he started having acid reflux and everything else because he was so worried about these people. He said, don't worry about it. Have some wine and go chew them out. A little bit, a little bit. For among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women weighed down with sins led on by various lusts. Verse 7. Always learning, but never able to come to an epinosis knowledge of doctrine. They never get to beyond gnosis. They're never filled with the Spirit. They never get their GPS, grace positioning satellite. They are never able to get into a position of grace because they're never filled with the Spirit. And they're constantly gossips, maligners, and judges both men and women. And the only way you'll ever get to grace orientation is by the filling of the Spirit. And the filling of the Holy Spirit will produce such things as grace orientation as we will note tomorrow night. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've studied. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.